converge on National Coming Out Day. Engage with gay and lesbian business leaders and celebrate their contributions to our community. Empower yourself as Walter Schubert shares his story of coming out on Wall Street and building the leading gay financial site, GFN.com. Hello, I'm Dr. Richard Kaufman. We have been on Paces Ferry at the Chattahoochee River since 1986. We do not require appointments. You may walk in at any time, Mondays through Fridays, 9 to 6. Your health will always be our greatest concern. Pride Realty, because there's no place like home. Whether you're buying, selling, renting, or relocating, Pride Realty has you covered. We're nationally recognized for our unique service to the gay and lesbian community. Call us at 404-352-5570 or visit our website at pridevilty.com. Gay political strategist, Democratic fundraiser, presidential advisor, and successful author David Mixner spoke to September's meeting of Atlanta Executive Network. Newsweek magazine has called Mixner the most powerful gay man in America. He's written two best-selling books, Stranger Among Friends, an autobiography in 1996, and his latest book, Brave Journeys, Profiles in Gay and Lesbian Courage. Out TV Atlanta spoke with David Mixner at the AEN meeting at Colony Square Hotel. Uh, David Mixner, welcome to Atlanta. Thank you. It's good to be here. Now, you were here back in the uh, 60s, May I? Did I read, like, down yes. in South Georgia yes. registering voters? Yeah, exactly. I was down in the Albany area and the Macon area. Americus. Yeah, Americus, Georgia. It was in 1968 we were putting a, uh, the first integrated delegation challenge in the history of Georgia back then. Right. In your original book, uh, Stranger Among Friends, uh, you trace a lot of that history. But you had, uh, if I may, Kit, who mm -hmm. died in an automobile mm -hmm. accident. Yeah. And then there was uh, Frank, mm -hmm. who mysteriously disappeared <laughs> in Washington yeah. after you said a passionate yeah. relationship. And then sadly, there was Peter, who died of AIDS. Uh, do you think in the gay world that those sort of passionate relationships are sort of what we're all about, or are there really lasting ones? And do you have that faith that there are? Well, first of all, I don't see anything wrong with passionate relationships. And, or short-term relationships if it's enriching and nourishing and exciting for the individuals involved and healthy for both parties. Uh, I try not to put parameters around anyone else's relationship if they're happy. But I think one of the things that we've explored and maybe one of the gifts we bring society is that because we have not allowed to be officially sanctioned our relationships in a number of ways, that we've had to explore uh, alternatives. And I think that in many ways that we are seeing in many of the heterosexual community uh, a copying some of those alternative ways that people can be together, love each other in a healthy, wonderful, positive sense, and at the same time, uh, meet the needs of a very complex society that we live in. Well, let's talk about the new book, Brave Journeys. You yeah. profile over about 50 years, seven persons, gay, le gay men and lesbians, from the two ladies in San Francisco who founded Daughters of Belitis to the new contemporary lady who is really on this forefront of the anti-hate campaign. Uh, the reason I wrote this book is because for the longest time when I was coming to terms with my homosexuality, I didn't feel like I came out of anything. I didn't feel like there was a tradition, a culture of who I was. Mm. And when I started looking into our history, I realized that I am a, 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 an extension of a courageous, extraordinary group of people who has given us a history beyond belief. And that far from not coming out of anything, we come out of a, a, a great trail of tears, a great battle for justice uh, from some remarkable individuals. And what about Al Gore? Where are we with, with him? I think it's one of the most important elections we face as a community in, in many, many years. Uh, not only because of Vice President Gore versus Bush, but because the uh, House of Representatives is up and the Senate's in play. And the Supreme Court. And the Supreme Court, as a result of both of those, is uh, definitely in play. So, I mean, what we could wake up on Election Day is George Bush, Dick Armey, and Bob Barr in control of the House, and then Trent Lott in control of the Senate, which would be a disaster for this community. Or we could wake up with uh, Dick Gebhardt, Al Gore, and Tom Daschle. And it's like two different worlds, you know. So are we the definitive swing vote now, do you think, in some ways? I think this is going to be one of the closest elections that we've ever had in our history. 
Uh, I'm going to talk a little bit about it tonight here at AEN. Uh, I think it could be determined by as low as one vote per precinct nationwide, wow. uh, as close as the Kennedy-Nixon race in 1960. Well, our Georgia Equality Project, you know, is uh, now registering exactly. gay voters here, and that's part of the struggle. I have, I'm advocating that no one should be allowed in the gay bar from uh, the whole month of October unless they show their voter registration card. <laughs> uh, David Mixer, we appreciate your time, and good luck in your speech It's my tonight. pleasure. Thank you so much. Welcome back to Atlanta. Thank you. It's great to be here. In his address to Atlanta Executive Network, Mixner spoke emotionally about his dying friend Peter Scott and how courage can directly affect the future of American politics. No group should understand more than our community what it means to be allowed to be at the table. My partner was a man named Peter Scott. He died in 1989 of AIDS. I loved him dearly. We were together 12 years. In 1988, he had just a few months to live. And he had been in bed for four months. And I went in in September and said, Peter, I, I want to fill out an absentee ballot for you, though quite honestly, I didn't think he'd make the election. And he said, no, I plan to vote that day. Now, he had not been in bed, a bed for four months. I knew he wasn't going to vote that day. But I didn't have the heart to tell him that he wasn't going to vote that day. I said, of course you are. Forgive me for asking. Come November, I came down to fix breakfast. He was laid there in bed. He says, I'm ready to vote. And I said, Peter, you can't. You haven't been out of bed in months. You have no energy. He was emaciated. He hardly had any weight left on him. He said, oh, yes, I can. I have to vote because I am in this bed. I have to vote because I don't want anyone else to be in this bed. Three of us carried him to the car, laid him in the back seat, took him to the polling place, which was in a private house up a driveway. And he pushed us away and almost like Jane Pittman walked up that driveway by himself to cast his vote. Came out of the voting booth and collapsed and we had to carry him home. How dare you not be registered? how you dishonor people like Peter Scott, who would give anything to be here today, to participate in this great, remarkable history and journey that we all are a part of.